evening, everyone. I'd like to call for order the City Council regular meeting, April 2nd, 2024. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chen? Here. Council Member Mann? Here. Council Member Sternquist? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Yu? Here. Mayor Chavez? Here. Oops, I better turn my microphone on. Okay. Uh, we will begin with our invocation. We're pleased to have Jerry Jambazian with us again tonight, owner of Wonder Cleaners and Draperies, located at 9136 Las Tunas Drive who will be providing tonight's invocation. So if you will please rise and remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mayor. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we come before you tonight asking for your blessings upon this City Council meeting. With this being the first meeting with our new Mayor and a new Council member, I pray that you would equip each member with the necessary discernment that would continue a legacy of accomplishments throughout this city. One thing that, I, that can be said about Temple City is that it always is open for business. Testament to that is our recent Easter egg event at Live Oak Park. Over 700 attendees braved the rain and had a wonderful time thanks to the work of our dedicated Parks and Recreation Department, better known as the Fun Department. So, Lord, we commit this time to you that you would continue the rich heritage that belongs to Temple City as we embark on the next 100 years. Lord, I, be, I would be remiss if I did not continue to bring before you those who serve and protect us around the world, including our firefighters, our deputies, and our own public safety team. Thank you for their continued concern for us. We ask this all in the name of your name and for your glory. Amen. 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 Please follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. Okay, we'll now move on to uh, item five on our agenda, our ceremonial matters and presentations. And I'm pleased to welcome tonight Gretchen Sterling from our farmer's market uh, to provide an update on uh, market activities. Gretchen? Good evening, Good evening. new council Good evening. And, and returning mayor. Um, it's, it's nice to be here with you. Uh, usually I'm a little later in the year. Um, this year I did not get to go on one of my farm tours to a foreign country. I just decided I don't like long flights anymore. I'd rather, you know, drive here from, from Pasadena in the morning. There's no traffic. It's, it's great, but 10-hour flights are long past my time now. Um, you know, we're, I think we started in 2011. We're coming up on 14, 13 years. And it's time that we make a little expansion because we're, we get enough customers to keep ourselves happy. But, you know, last year was the first year we were able to get um, through a partnership that I have with Hunger Action Los Angeles, a matching program for folks who use CalFresh. And we do, you know, 25 to $4,000 worth of CalFresh for our customers, where we, I'm, I'm one of the few people you will ever meet who has authority from the government to produce and distribute currency. Because the CalFresh program doesn't, doesn't let you have dollar bills to um, buy from at individual stands like our farmer's markets. In the grocery store, you go through the line, you hit the machine and you make your transaction. Well, here you do your transaction ahead with us, so you have legal currency. You go to the, the farmers and you pay your CalFresh money and you get your product. But because last year we were able to start with Hunger Action Los Angeles, we do a match program. So for the first $20, up to $20, I'll match dollar for dollar. So they get to double their benefits um, and, and deal directly with farmers. So last year for this half a year, 
we had over $3,000 that we gave away and was used for fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, with, and it doesn't matter which community, but most of our customers are, are from Temple City. Some of few from Arcadia, but mostly Temple City. And so it's really nice to have returning people come and making that relationship with farmers because I want you all to know where your food comes from. That is my goal in life, is knowing where your food comes from and making sure that you are getting the best quality that you can and the freshest. You know, when there's a recall of eggs and Trader Joe's has their eggs recalled, it's because they're from Nebraska. I'm sorry. Ours, everything here is from California, and we're really proud of the, the contributions that they make to our residents of, of your city and all of Los Angeles County throughout the, the year. Um, the other thing that we want to do is we have always shied away from cooking on site, um, where we have, have farmers who can do additional things with some of their product as well as um, other people who get the health department license in order to participate at the farmer's market and actually cook on site. So we're working towards that this year. We need a three compartment sink, which we understand the city has um, over at Live Oak Park. And we're gonna see how we can um, get to be able to use that, get the permit for it um, and and utilize that for two or three people. You know, we, we would love to have popcorn, but you have to cook popcorn. You'd love to have some breakfast items, but you have to cook those things. And so that's where our direction is this year. Um, we've also lost one of our original farmers. Um, last week was the last week for our Asian vegetable man from um, just out of Fresno. He and his wife have been with us all of these years, and he's, his children told him he's too old to come. He's younger than I am, but he's too old to come. Aside from the fact that he gets up at 2 o'clock in the morning and starts driving, um, I wouldn't do that, but, but he has done that for all these years. And so he has retired, so we're on the hunt for a new um, Asian vegetable person. Weren't they one of the largest? Uh... They were one of our largest, and it's just, uh, I'm really sorry to say that they're stopping just in front of sour leaf season. It's not an item that I am particularly uh, well acquainted with, but many of our customers are, and they would stand in line, and they would call and order and in the middle of the week, and they'd come and get their box or boxes. I was here one day, some man drove from Las Vegas and got his seven boxes of sour leaf. I, I didn't know it was that difficult to get, but obviously it's a very uh, high demand product. So we're, we're asking him if he has neighbors who are, are willing to make this drive that he's made every week for the last 10 and a half years. Where is he coming from? Just north of Fresno, oh my in Madeira. That's a long ways. That's a long ways. There's yes. no one closer. <laughs> Not much. Yeah. No. But there's mm -hmm. there's different regions that grow different things really well, and what he grows really grows well in the Fresno area. So mm -hmm. it's you know we have, and I have to tell you my very favorite time of the morning, because I did not grow up here like Selena did. Um, is when I'm here and the parrots fly over. And I'm all excited, oh good, the morning is starting, and she's going, Nyarrr. but um, it, I think it has to do with, it didn't wake me up as a teenager, maybe. But that's my very favorite part of the Sunday morning, is being here when the parrots fly over. Um, the, that's, we're doing well. We're, I'm, has like I say, I'm- Has the rain affected you at all? Has the rain affected? Of course the rain has affected us and, um, and things don't grow as well or they're not on time or they get, if it's too late in the season for it, they get waterlogged. Um, some of the strawberries haven't been real good because they haven't had enough. Mm. Um, the, the man who comes from Santa Maria, he gets a lot of water and that's at the wrong time and then the berries don't taste quite as good. And, Hopefully, hopefully rain is over soon for us. 
Uh, I was just telling um, Peggy that my tarp rains from inside because it has had so much and it is no longer waterproof. It, it rains from inside. I, I have to get a new tarp. But okay. if you have any questions, I'd be glad to. Well, thank to, you. Uh, uh, do any council members have any questions? No, I'm good. Thank good? You. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you, you for your presentation. Uh, continue. And, you know, and as we talked, Mayor, uh, we would love to have you. Uh, yeah, we'll get back to you on that. And uh, uh, if there's anything else you need, especially with some of these new projects you're working on, certainly you can contact our city manager and we'll do whatever yes, we can uh, to I've facilitate that. Yes, I've already been in, that. in contact with Mr. Cook about our. Perfect. Our, Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we have anything else for item five. So we will now move on to item six, public comments on items not listed on the agenda. City Council will now hear public comments regarding items that are not listed on the agenda. And I do have one speaker request form from one of our favorite people. Where is she? Valerie Munoz from the Water Quality Authority. So. Valerie, come on up. Hi, good evening, Mayor, and congratulations on the new appointments, Thank and you. also to Councilmember Chen. You look like a new face I've never seen before. <laughs> um, but I'm Valerie Munoz, Councilmember for the City of La Puente, and I represent your great city of Temple City on the San Gabriel Basin Water Quality Authority, representing cities with non-pumping rights. Um, for the newcomer, that means we don't own water, we don't have a water agency in our city. Um, so. Just wanted to just kind of say hello. Thank you again for your for your support on my reappointment to my seat in December, um, but also just to give you an update in regards to what water funding we're moving forward to. Um, so just a ge general overview, our agency was established in 96 by the state of California, and our whole goal is to create funding for the San Gabriel Basin um, for water cleanup efforts. We don't sell water. We're not in the business of um, anything in that regards, but our whole purpose is to secure federal and state funding. Right now we are going after federal appropriations around $10 million, which would go towards the cleanup efforts in the basin, which serves City of Temple City and your residents as well. And it's really important in regards to this federal funding. Um, the federal funding was created um, through the state, the federal government. And some cities ask, well, you know, how can we do to help support your efforts, you know, support letters, and I believe I sent an email last month um, in regards to asking for support letters um, for our cause. And again, the, this is, has no um, funding elements in your city. There's no issues in that regards. And the only monies that that's been appropriated to is for us as the water basin and also for the central basin for water cleanup. So um, the waters, that funding is used specifically for that. Um, and the goal is, is the more funding we get, the less the break payers are gonna, are gonna have to pay because we're subsidizing um, our water um, agencies to continue with the cleanup efforts in the area. So like I say to our council members, we're a great agency because you know we create the, the monies to keep our water clean so that we can sustain our water basins here and not have to rely on import waters, keeping our um, water rates low because we're not passing those um, those requirements to our rate payers. So that is our goal. Um, everyone's always welcome to come to the agency for a tour. I know somebody, people say, well, water's kind of boring, but it's, it's life. And you, you learn a lot. Before I started the agency, I thought, hey, you just turn on the water faucet and you get water, right? But there's so much behind it. And it's great to um, have that understanding that we sit on a basin that serves over 1.7 million people here in the area as well. So again, thank you, and I just wanted to say hello, and here I am. All right. Well, thank Good you night. for coming and keeping us updated. We yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else like to speak to the council at this time? If not, then I will uh, close public comments. We will now move on to item number seven, our consent calendar. All consent <coughs> calendar items may be approved in a single motion. Uh, as recommended, unless removed for further discussion. Mayor Chavez? Yes, uh, city manager. Staff would like to pull item of seven, or excuse me, 4C for uh, further discussion and just some clarifications. Okay, and then I'm going to pull item B uh, also. Uh, anyone else? Okay, uh, can we have a motion uh, to move forward? I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar 
except for item B and C. And C. Second. Thank you. Uh, can we get a roll call, please? Council Member Chen? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yu? Yes. Mayor Chavez? Yes. Okay. Brian, why don't you go first? You want me to go first or you want to go first? Whatever you'd like, your preference. Well, B is for, before C, so. All yours. <laughs> <laughs> yours is going to take a little longer than mine, probably. Uh, the reason I pulled item B is that our yearly adoption of uh, resolution confirming the mayor's appointment of council members to serve as delegates and alternates to other agencies and organizations that we participate in. So I just wanted to go over those briefly with everyone out there and those who are listening in on, online. Um, just to let you know, uh, it, not too many changes from, from last year, but of course we have a new council member who is uh, gladly filled in in many of the areas. So um, I just want to go over those briefly with everyone. So I'll just go through them. We have, uh, first of all, our city liaisons. We have our local clergy outreach, which I am the liaison for that. Uh, our Camellia Festival, which Council Member Sternquist will be the city liaison. We have our San Gabriel Valley Humane Society. Liaison will be Council Member Mann, and the alternate is Mayor Pro Tem Yu. Uh, Temple City Chamber of Commerce, the liaison will be Council Member Chen. Uh, Temple City Sister City, I will be the liaison as well as the liaison for the Youth Committee and the Committee on Aging. That kind of balances out, I think, the youth and the aging, right? <laughs> so I get a little bit of each. Okay. Tom, so, is that both sister cities? Uh, we only have one official sister oh, city. Uh, okay. uh, we, I know what you're saying. We do have a, a sister city, but we're not actively doing anything. And I don't know that we had, William, you maybe you can correct me. Do we have a liaison? I don't think we do uh, normally with the uh, Hualem. Yeah, point. I, I think the, or, the origin of that liaison was because the Hawkesbury sister city was formed. It was formally recognized through the international sister yeah. cities. Kind of relationship. Well, that's something that maybe we should talk about in the future. That maybe we can have a liaison. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we, we but can, yeah, we'll bring that up. We can bring and that we'll up. Talk to our city okay. manager about. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, we have several organizations that the city participates in are contract cities. Uh, the delegate will be Council Member Chen, and the alternate will be Council Member Sternquist. LA County City Selection Committee, Council Member Mann, and the alternate is Council Member Sternquist. Our Upper San Gabriel Valley Water District, I will be the delegate. The alternate will be Council Member Chen. Uh, but I think uh, Council Member Sternquist has agreed to continue uh, attending those meetings. Okay. League of California Cities, we have delegate Council Member Mann. Council Member uh, Chen is the alternate for that. Clean Power Alliance, Director Council Member Chen. Alternate Director Council Member Mann. Uh, Joint Powers Insurance Authority, I am the delegate, and the alternate is Mayor Pro Tem Yu. Our SCAG, our Southern California Association of Governments, our delegate and policy committee member is Council Member Sternquist, and I will serve as the alternate to that association. Foothill Transit Zone, Council Member Chen is the delegate, and the alternate is Council Member Mann. Uh, oh, no, I, I misspoke. I, I talked about the county sanitation district. That's, yeah. no, no, that's right. No, I, I, I said the right thing. You're not going to be attending those. I misspoke. I, that's the LA County Sanitation District. That I'm going to That attend. you're going to. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, they, they require a mayoral delegate, so I will be the delegate to uh, LA County Sanitation District, but Council Member Sternquist is the alternate, but will be attending the meetings. Yes. Thank you for doing that. The mosquito abatement, uh, Council Member Sternquist's favorite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> district, so she'll be on that still. Uh, San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments, our delegate is Council Member Sternquist, and I will be the alternate for that. Uh, we do have several standing committee and ad hoc committees, but I think I'm going to hold that for when we go over that as part of the agenda. Okay? And that's all I have for that. So why don't we go to item C now? Thank you, Mayor Travis and members of the council. Before you tonight is the mid century general plan annual progress report. And what that essentially does, and we have a very brief presentation for you as well, what that essentially does is two things. It provides, uh, statutorily we are required to report back to the state on two things. One of which is how we're doing on our arena numbers, how we are doing on our housing production. 
And we have a couple graphs that we'll show you on the presentation, but is in the staff report as well. The other is, um, and credit again to staff for an amazing job working with our consultants, getting a certified housing element. That housing element had a litany of items, and that is that work plan that you see, that very extensive work plan that you see the community development department go through. That is what essentially got us to the certification by the by HCD to have a certified housing element. So those are the components of why what why we why we submit this port. It is statutorily required by the state of California, and quite frankly the state is becoming more punitive in its approach to cities related to its progress on RENA, its um, housing production, and its, and its progress in, in complying with the general plan. We've seen several cities throughout Southern California there where the state of California is taking punitive action against cities that frequently violate that. Luckily, as this community and this council and the planning commission we have come together with a general plan that the community agreed upon that have elements that ensure that we keep our quality of life here, but also meet some of the, the state mandates that have come down over the last few years. So with that, Mayor Chavez, I'll have Scott, our community development director, probably just a, a brief overview. And if there's any questions or anything, we're, we're happy to answer. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, could we get a motion on item B before moving on to item C? We usually do them both at the okay. same time. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't forget about it. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, the first part of the staff report that was submitted includes a list of the items that uh, we've performed uh, in 2023. There were 13 um, different items that we um, that we moved forward on that brought us into compliance with the housing element that calls for certain programs to be adopted. Um, so there's a list here. Um, and so some of those things were to let religious institutions in the city know what their rights are to build um, housing on their sites. Um, we created some informational brochures. Um, we drafted some ordinances. And of course, this was all done with the help of some consultants to help implement the, the parts, the programs under the housing element. Um, we also developed some applications for um, uh, SB 35 projects. We looked at evaluating uh, the, our, the awareness in the community about housing rights. Um, we looked at temporary rent subsidies and um, prepared a draft ordinance on anti-idling. Um, that's for large diesel vehicles. Um, and then in addition to those were the housing programs that we um, moved forward on. Um, in addition to that, there were also other things outside of the housing element, and those included the approval of the objective design standards in the R2 zone, uh, a series code amendments, series C code amendments. We amended the SB9 ordinance. The Planning Commission and the City Council also reviewed and approved um, an ordinance regarding artificial turf. Um, and then uh, we posted an RFP um, for impact fee ordinance, preparing that. Um, and then we also performed a market feasibility study in conjunction with the COG on doing an inclusionary housing ordinance. Um, so those are the programs that we made progress on in 2023. The other thing that we looked at um, was how much housing uh, got permitted and got completed in 2023. Um, so new single family homes, uh, two permits were issued and then two, issue, two, per, two single family units were also occupied, so the permits were completed. Um, we had nine multifamily units permitted and 79 uh, were, received certificates of occupancy and that's mostly the mixed use project on Rosemead Boulevard. And then ADUs, we saw 62 permits issued and um, 42 were completed. So the number of permits issued totaled 73, and the number of projects completed uh, was 123. And then uh, the other part of what we're required to do by the state is to show our progress in regards to RENA. Um, RENA is um, a goal that's set by SCAG um, for regional housing needs. So we're supposed to demonstrate how we're meeting the region's housing needs. Again, it's important to remember that with RENA, we're only required to demonstrate that we have capacity to meet RENA. We do not have to actually uh, build the units that are given to us. Um, 
So on the left-hand column, you see how, much, how many units we were allocated. The total among all the different cost categories was 2,186 units. And then we broke that down into the time periods under the current um, housing element cycle. Um, and so you can see that we still have, um, based on the arena, we still need to build 1,935 units in order to meet that goal. But again, we just need to demonstrate compliance um, that we have sufficient capacity to do that. Um, the reason why extremely low income is in its own table is that extremely low income is actually a subset of very low income. So it's easier to just pull that out and put it in its own table. Um, so the way we demonstrate that we have capacity is we run it through what's called the site inventory table. And so that top line there is um, the same numbers you saw on the last slide, which was um, the RENA numbers. So for instance, we would need to build 837 above moderate uh, units, or a total of 2,186 in all the different income categories. Then the next two rows are like the credits we get toward that. So um, during that period, we've built 275 ADUs. Um, we've entitled or proposed 166 projects. Um, I'm sorry, that wasn't under the housing element. We expected to approve 275 ADUs. We expect to, uh, at the time, we had 166 projects entitled or proposed. And so that, la that last number there that says remaining RENA, that bolded number, that's everything else that we need to build. Um, and then the site inventory, there's a very uh, parcel by parcel analysis that's done to demonstrate um, that we do have capacity on specific sites to meet those numbers. And the, the important thing to see here is that the remaining RENA allocation is 1,745. Looking at the sites that we have, we have room for 2,135 units. So we actually have a surplus of inventory of 390. That's where we want to be. You don't want to get into the point where you have a deficit, otherwise then you have to rezone properties. So keeping that number up is what we're looking for. And that was part of the reason when we went to the general plan process, so we were so concerned about having to upzone areas that were not traditionally needed to be upzoned, our single family homes. I mean, we made a true value choice about where we put the density. And you're seeing that manifest itself in some of the developments that we're seeing today. And again, these are Rena's numbers. These are, these are good faith efforts for, uh, for us to try to get there. But there are practicalities of, for example, the marketplace, what the market can actually bear. And so, but I think what these numbers show, and we, we will, and we've argued, and we will continue to talk with HD about as we go through the review process again in several, in about five more years, that we're making efforts towards this. We are, and we're trying to meet that with those requirements. We are not trying to be scoff laws, for lack of a better term, in, 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 in dealing with the housing goals of the state. Uh, and then the last section of the staff report demonstrates our work, proposed work plan for 2024. Um, the first few are um, to bring us into compliance either um, with code or with the general plan programs and policies. So one is to update our subdivision regulations to continue forward with the objective design, design standards program. Um, the council asked us to look into doing template ADU plans, so that's in the work program. Um, and then um, continue to work on that impact fee study that we received a proposal for. And then the remaining ones are um, programs that are in the housing element. Um, in order to get a certified housing element, these are the programs that we agreed to. And these are the ones that we said we would do in 2024 or 2025. Um, and so some of those are um, just updating a multi our multifamily site inventory, um, coming into compliance with state law on special needs housing, um, re rezoning reused sites. Um, so if you use a site multiple times over multiple housing elements, you then have to rezone it over time. Um, the Crossroads specific plan was to just study or evaluate um, whether we wanted to make some changes there to um, reduce the requirement to do mixed use, but instead do only multifamily. That's not something we have to do. We're just to, required to evaluate that. Actually, on that, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Reed Maria, as I, as, I, as I was reading this, I was a little puzzled why we want at least study the pro prohibition of residential use within two, 250 feet. Well, what advantage would that bring, bring us? Yeah, the, the, um, 
the the what they want us to what they want what HDD wanted us to evaluate was um, the requirement that the ground floor needed to be a commercial use. So they wanted us to look at whether um, further away from the major intersections we would be willing to allow a standalone multifamily instead of mixed use. Okay. Yeah. Um, All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, looking at infrastructure grants, the idea there is that if we can put some grants in place for infrastructure that helps reduce the cost of development, um, we need to update the ADU code to make sure that it's in compliance with state law, which is honestly a moving target. Um, density bonus provisions, we need to make some modifications there because there's a new density bonus bills. Um, we talked about, we've done a study of inclusionary housing policies, so that's probably one we can um, check off the list. Um, enhanced density bonus, um, again, the, the, the program was to look at whether we would be interested in doing an enhanced density bonus program. Um, so we will evaluate that. Um, uh, we need to amend the zoning code with regards to community care facilities, um, eliminate a minimum floor area standard in the R3 zone. That's also a requirement of state law. Um, and then evaluate a safe parking program. Um, our sewer reconstruction fee needs to be reevaluated. Um, it treats um, projects that are one to four units in one way and anything more than four units another way. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it um, means that we're not going to recoup the sewer costs for very large projects. Um, so that's something we need to evaluate. Farm worker housing, um, although it's not an issue in our city, uh, it, there is state law that says we need, it, we need to come into compliance with it. So it's just one of those things we've got to do. Um, to look at uh, parking requirements for smaller units, if we reduce parking requirements for smaller units, that would um, perhaps get us more smaller units. Again, this one is just to um, evaluate that idea. Um, SB9 compliance, um, we've complied with a portion of that. We need to finish the study on SB9. And then there's, um, the state asked us to look at our condo uh, conversion restrictions and perhaps um, set a standard by which we would modify the condo conversion requirements. Um, the state wants us to keep more um, rental housing and doesn't want us to have more conversion to condo. Um, so that's something that we need to study. Scott, um, yeah. I'm a little confused with that. Okay. The state wants us to, say that again? The state wants us to have a good share of rental housing in addition to for sale housing. Um, it makes no sense <laughs> with the requirements that the state imposes on municipalities to create more affordable housing and they consider ADUs, I mean, but, and they want more home ownership. And it's I, part of it, and again, these, that's why it, this is process is the evaluate. We, we, could, we did not say we shall, <laughs> we said we will evaluate. And that's, and that's the, really the checklist that HCD went through agency by agency and every agency got emphasized something different than others so this was kind of the litany list of things to say can you and we and that's and again credit to scott scott to our consultants as well and our legal team for really going through there and not binding the council from a policy standpoint right, right? right. that we you, you know you you see where you see where some things are statutorily required right and that's pretty clear we can't get around that some of the density bonus laws changes and things like that but things like this we have discretion and those are the things over the next year we got to we we will come back to you and then when we come back to you whatever decision we made with the findings what we've made with those we can go back then to the state and said we did our due diligence <laughs> we've evaluated this is the policy decision we've made as the as the council Uh, Actually, yeah. I have a Go ahead, question sorry. related to Councilmember Sternquist. Does the state consider ADUs as rental units in yes. that calculation? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank, you. Um, Thank you. For the fair, fair Housing Program, they just want us to raise awareness of it. Um, that's why we put out the survey to start to figure out how much people know about the Fair Housing Program, and then we can start tracking um, people's awareness of it. Um, a rental assistance program, which is on your agenda tonight. Um, that anti-displacement resources, again, just putting out information about anti-displacement. And the last one there is um, really just that anti-idling ordinance that I mentioned before. It's been drafted. We just need to 
bring it to the Planning Commission and to you for your consideration. So, and that will bring us into compliance with one of the CEQA EIR requirements for the crossroads specific plan. So, so with that, um, the recommendation on this staff report was to receive the report, uh, find an exempt from CEQA, and then approve the annual report and direct staff to forward it to the state. Thank you. Anything else? No. Nope. Any further questions from council? Hearing okay. none, can we have a motion on items B and C? So moved. Okay. We have a motion to approve items B and C. We have a second? A second. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Council Member Chen? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yu? Yes. Mayor Chavez? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. And Scott, <coughs> we'll just stay right there. We've got item eight, our public hearing. Uh, uh, item A, amend the adopted traffic thresholds of significance for the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, <coughs> related to vehicle miles traveled. And so uh, we're gonna turn it over to you first. Sure, right? thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Um, this action tonight uh, for your consideration is really part of another state process. Is we've, um, the state has moved away from what is called level of service, LOS, in evaluating from a CEQA perspective the impacts of a, a project. Um, what staff has done in, consult, in consultation with the COG and com consultation with one of expert consultants as well is really come up with th thresholds of significance from, with vehicle miles traveled that really fit who we are as a community and uh, essentially meet what the, what the state is requiring of us. That's, I think that's the first step is this is what the state is requiring of us. And Scott will talk about this a little bit more. And also to taking that one step of what, doing what the state is requiring of us of essentially reducing vehicle miles traveled <laughs> with projects before a CEQA process is kicked in with a project. Think of, uh, a small hardware store versus a Home Depot. <laughs> we want to make what the, the overall goal is. You want that local hardware store to not have to kick in the secret process. But generally speaking, because something like a Home Depot has more regional impact, regional flow from outside of Temple City, that's when that CEQA process would kick in. So this is an effort in essentially to smooth out not elongate and even shorten the, the process of approval for so that you don't kick in, as all many of you know, the CEQA process, depending on the project, can be very long and very cumbersome. So this is one of those efforts to do that as well. And also, too, Scott will talk about why the differences between uh, why we chose the COG versus the Southeast subregion versus Temple City in several of the areas. So we'll, wa we'll walk through that this, the, this evening. So with that, Mayor, I can turn over to Mr. Reamers. Thank you, Mr. Reamers. Go ahead. Um, so just as a matter of introduction, I wanted to pull back to the general plan. And the guidance under the general plan um, was to help improve air quality. And the VMT uh, thresholds that are before you tonight um, will help reduce air quality by reduced vehicle trips. Um, it was to improve the land use mix and a balance. So the idea was to create a balanced mix of different land uses. When those are more in balance, then people aren't traveling as far. If you have one community that's all commercial, then people have to come farther because there's no residences in that community. So having that, that land use mix and a balance of that helps reduce VMT. And then the, um, the mobility goal was to create a sustainable transportation system. And a large part of VMT is reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions um, and reducing air quality impacts. And that helps create that sustainable transportation network. Um, so the council action for you tonight is to adopt new thresholds of significance under CEQA. And for, um, for the public here, I know that's a really weird thing to say, a threshold of significance, what does that mean? Well, what we're talking about is the California Environmental Quality Act. And the purpose of CEQA is not to stop projects. It's not even to stop projects that have a bad environmental impact. The purpose of CEQA is to review a project's impact and then to disclose those impacts to the community and to mitigate them to the, to the amount feasible. So it's to review it, to, to mitigate it and to disclose it. And by mitigate, I mean to reduce it. So you can approve a project even if it has significant unavoidable <coughs> impacts. That's, co that's completely possible. It, the goal of CEQA is really just to make sure the public's aware of the decision that was made. 
So there's and is that to give them an opportunity to object or yes. take whatever action they deem? Yes, and it's and part of um, if you're adopting an EIR because you have a significant unavoidable impact, um, it, the council gets to make a decision: is this project coming with community benefits? And then it opens up that conversation about the benefits that the community sees um, along with the envir negative environmental impacts. So. so there's four different types of impacts under CEQA. There's no impact; that's clear. Um, there's projects that are less than significant, and in those cases, you'll hear planners talk about a negative declaration. There's projects that are less significant when you have mitigation measures. So if we put these mitigation measures in place, it reduces that impact to less than significant. That's called a mitigated neg deck. Um, and then the last one is when you have a significant and unavoidable impact. And that just means if we, even if we put mitigation measures in place, we're still gonna have some significant impacts. And so the, the threshold of significance is where you move from a less than significant impact into a significant impact. So visually speaking, um, your first section is no impact, and then your next section would be a less than significant impact, and then you, on the top level, you would have a significant impact, and the location between the less than significant to significant is your threshold of significance. And so that's what we're talking about tonight, is where do we want to set that threshold of significance in terms of vehicle miles traveled? Srinima, perhaps you can also mention uh, we, we often see a lot of projects that are categorically exempt. So how does yes. that tie into the, what yeah. you just talked about? <laughs> That's great. So um, before you even start to ask yourself whether a project is going to have significant impacts, some projects are already categorically exempt. And in, in our community, many of them are categorically exempt. Um, if you're doing an addition to a house, if you're building a new house, um, those are categorically exempt from CEQA. Even a four-unit condominium subdivision is exempt from CEQA. So many of the projects that we do, even our mixed-use projects, um, there have been exemptions under CEQA that they can rely on. Some of those exemptions still require a minimal amount of uh, study that's done, um, but uh, many of our projects are reviewed, um, are exempt from, so yeah, maybe one project a year goes through this formal process. So vehicle miles traveled was a concept that was developed under SB 743. And um, what it requires us to look at is the total number of trips times the length of those trips. That's the basic idea. So um, if you drive one mile to the grocery store and another mile to work and another mile, mile home, that's um, three trips. And they're each a mile, so it's three. Um, so three times three is nine. Um, no, three times one is three. <laughs> three times one is three, so your total number of VMT would be three. Um, so it's really talking more about not congestion, but how, how long people are moving and how far they're going. And so the, one of the benefits of looking at VMT is it helps reduce air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. Just so you know, um, when you approved the general plan, we kept the LOS standards as a general plan policy. So LOS still looks at congestion. We still look at congestion in our traffic study guidelines because we know that's something important. Um, so that's something we still study, but that's not something we're talking about right now. So the reason why we're here tonight is because SCAG has updated its traffic model, which it needs to do every um, few years. It needs to update its model. And they updated it with tra new traffic counts, new roadway network improvements. So new roads have been built, freeways, on-ramps, off-ramps. Transit services changed, uh, socioeconomic factors also affect the way people travel. And then the big change was changing it from a trip-based model to an activity-based model. And so all of that changed our numbers and our map and, and everything. So um, what I need you to know tonight is that for the most part, um, what you had previously approved when it came to VMT is not changing. Most of what you did is not going to change. We're going to still keep screening out local serving projects. So local serving projects don't um, increase VMT. They likely reduce VMT because instead of driving to Pasadena to do something, you're now driving to Temple City. That reduces the number of vehicle miles traveled. So all of those local serving projects are already screened out. They don't go through this review. And so those would be any retail or commercial project under 50,000 square feet, local parks, daycare centers, churches, those sites of things. So why the less than 50,000? Is that... That was so just guidance, yeah, that was guidance by the state. Yeah. Um, we're gonna keep screening out projects that are already in low VMT areas. If, 
if you're building something in a low VMT area, then you're likely just only going to reduce low VMT. Um, it, projects that are in transit priority areas, um, those will keep being screened out, and affordable housing projects will keep getting screened out. Projects that are not screened out need to have a baseline set. So we need to compare the VMT impact of this project to something to see if it's having an impact. And so what we're doing is we're comparing the project's VMT to a baseline VMT. And when we set a baseline VMT, we're looking at the average VMT of some area. And that's, that's the question before you tonight, is what area do you want to compare projects to? Do you want to compare the project to the city? to the sub area of the COG, which for us is Alhambra, San Gabriel, Temple City, El Monte, or do you want to compare us to the whole COG region? And there's benefits to choosing different, um, different areas for different reasons. So um, the staff is recommending uh, the following. So there's three different types of VMT. So that only com further complicates this, I apologize. There's three different types of VMT. One is VMT per employee, and then there's VMT per capita, and then there's VMT per service population. So for VMT per employee, um, the thing to focus on is that we're recommending that we would compare it to the VMT in the southwest sub area. Uh, in VMT per capita, we're recommending we compare it to the city. And then the VMT per service population, we're recommending that we compare it to the COG region. So what is the southwest sub area? The southwest sub area are the cities in like Alhambra, Alhambra, San Gabriel, okay. Temple City, Almonte. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, the, yeah, I think I can go to the next slide. So the reason, the reason why we're recommending that allotment, and I know it seems strange, under state law, we're allowed to select different regions. We don't have to pick. Temple City across the board, or the, the whole COG region across the board. They said that we can choose what we think is best. But um, in alignment with the general plan goals and the specific plan goals, um, we believe that um, what, we're, what we've put before you tonight will make it easier CEQA process for projects that reduce that limit VMT. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, what we're looking for as a community. We want to see growth. We want to see growth that's compliant with the general plan. And when it is compliant with the general plan, um, that will go through an easier CEQA process. It's less likely to trigger that um, threshold. Um, projects that cause a huge jump in VMT, we want to do additional analysis on that to make sure, are there ways we can reduce VMT? And there's, we can talk about what, what those mitigation measures might look like if you want. Um, now, the, it's important to know also that um, SCAG changes the, tr the TRIP model every few years. So, so that we don't have to come back every two years and have this discussion, or every four years and have this discussion, um, the, the direction that's in the resolution would be to continue to use the highest of the city, the sub area of the region. So that's what we're proposing tonight. In each of these items, we're proposing you to use the highest, which is the southwest sub area, the city, and the region. And then when the SCAG numbers change based on the update, we would continue to use the highest in the future. Um, so the recommendation hey, the, is that yep. just so you don't have to come back every two or four years and bore us with this? Or? Yes. Because we, we don't mind. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, job, it, but, unless, yeah. unless, the policy, unless the policy changes with the council. Okay. Um, it, it's our understanding that the policy is to move forward with the general plan and not to upset it. Right. Um, if we get a new policy direction from you, then we can always come back and reassess the, the VMT thresholds. Okay. Thank you. So, so basically, the, the recommendation tonight is to adopt this resolution. That adoption um, will approve those VMT standards that I talk about, and then we'll update the traffic study guidelines as well. I just wanted to note that uh, Sarah Brandenburg from Fair and Pierce um, was a great traffic um, engineering company is here <laughs> to also answer questions. OK. Thank you. Yep. Well, we'll start first, then, with any council questions. I know we've asked a few questions so far, but uh, Councilmember Chen, do you have any other questions at this time for uh, Director Reimers? Okay, thank you. Councilmember Mann, any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Mayor Chavez. Uh, Director Reimers, when you had a slide that said mitig mitigation would be necessary for projects that would jump the VMT, Based on our current general plan and land use across the city, is there any possible project that would trigger that jump? 
Yes, um, projects that uh, increase VMT are projects that uh, would be of regional significance. Um, you see large jumps in VMT when, for instance, if you have a Costco come in or a super Walmart, that's going to bring in trips not just from your community but from the surrounding area. That's going to have an increase in VMT. So at that point, we would want to do some additional analysis to see is there ways of mitigating that um, to reduce the VMT impact. So I, I guess does that mean in general the crossroads specific plan region could potentially have projects that trigger this? Um, or, or is the crossroads specific the, plan already already sets the parameters such that this trigger will never happen? It, it's not likely to happen. Um, okay. One of the things, one of the best ways of mitigating a project's VMT is by putting a lot of destinations together in one place. So having a mixed use project reduces your VMT. So one way to reduce VMT on a commercial project is to add a residential component. Um, a, the compliance with the, that's exactly what we planned for in the Crosswoods specific plan was mixed use development. So. So, so it's tied largely to the intended use of the site. Yes. Yeah. So let's say a, a Ralph's, we already have a Ralph's, but let's say another supermarket moves in. Is that something, is that an example of something that would trigger it's, this jump in VMT? It, or It's not likely um, because a grocery store is most likely to be local serving retail. Okay. So I, yeah. I was trying to get a sense of what is the scale of the use mm. before this jump is triggered, because yeah, I'm not um, sure what that is. I, I don't know, Sarah, if you have some experience reviewing um, CEQA documents for projects that create uh, VMT impacts, do you have some examples that we could talk about? Sure, um, yeah, Sarah Brandenburg with Fair and Peers, good evening. Um, good evening. Yeah, I think Scott's example of a, more of a Costco, a wall, like super Walmart type store, a, a retail establishment that has that regional draw, right, that you probably don't, be, you're not able to drive to within 10 miles of the city right now and you want to add to the city and it's hard to justify how that wouldn't have a regional draw. Um, something like a smaller little convention center um, that's attracting tourists from around the region, um, maybe a new um, employment center, like a more of a regional employment center that is expected to have a more regional draw. Uh, but definitely, the more you're focusing on mixed use and combining the employment and commercial and residential uses, the least likely you are to have a VMT impact. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have for now. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Sternquist, any further questions at this time? No, I've heard this many times, being a member of SCAG's Transportation Committee. So, yeah. No. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a similar question to uh, Council Member Mint, but my is perhaps a little bit um, uh, more general. I mean, in your slides, the easiest equal process for a project with limited VM team, I was going to ask, can you give me some examples of uh, projects with limited VMT? And then also to the point of all regional centers that might generate a lot of VMT, BMT, what mitigation can a project like that uh, can employ to uh, reduce its significance? So um, from, from a mitigation perspective, that's something that the transportation world is trying to figure out. Um, the San Gabriel Valley COG has actually looked at creating a trans, uh, mitigation uh, impact um, fee to help um, do some more regional projects. Mm. Um, but uh, there's the potential to do um, some physical improvements, such as bike lane improvements, um, funding improvements that um, make it more likely that people will use active transportation, walking, bicycling, things like that. Um, another easy one, really, is to um, for that use to give away a certain a number of um, transit passes. Uh, to, to community members, um, that's going to reduce VMT. Um, there's another an, another easy way, as I mentioned with, before, is to add additional uses to the site, um, such as uh, a residential use, or if you have an office development, if you have some retail that's added to the site as well. Um, those are also some potentials for mitigation. And one other thing too, and it is it would be remote, but it would have to we'd have to deal with some issues with zoning and otherwise is if you entered into an agreement with the developer too of a site and you looked at 
some mitigation measures as well. But generally speaking, the way our city is zoned and everything else, uh, a, a development agreement with a developer is probably not likely. We were looking at those maybe happening with the with the and within the crossroads specific plan. But as things are playing out, and more likely as that development is phased over time and has different iterations. That's not as likely of a, of a scenario, more of what Mr. Reimers has talked about is more of the likely scenarios that we would be facing. And what, this, what the COG and the way they're trying to tackle this is going to play out. And one, one big benefit of working with the COG is that they've created a tool for the whole COG region. So a developer, before they even um, submit their application, can go in, they can put in uh, the site information, they can put in um, what they're proposing and it will tell them whether there's going to be a VMT impact. And if so, they'll know that from the start um, and then they can modify the project from the very beginning. Yeah. To bring it in compliance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions at this time, I'm going to open up public hearing. Does anyone for the audience wish to speak on this matter? Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. We'll entertain now any council final questions and comments. Does anybody have any further questions or comments at this time? No further questions. Uh, Mayor, Mayor, sure. if I could just sure. one, one more Mayor. just point of clarification. Sure. So when, this, when the SCAG model got updated from 2016 to 2020, in general, did it indicate that there was going to be more VMT because I and I'm only saying that because the maps that was shown in the report seems like all the regions increased so yeah. is, is yeah. that is that the correct interpretation or is it, that the it, wrong I, I think I it, that's the way it looks yes um, but what really happened behind the scenes is that SCAG completely changed how it was going to count VMT and that was the change from an activity-based model to a trip-based model. Um, and they used, so each segment they used to count separately. They didn't look at a whole trip that somebody was taken. And when they made that change to the model, to a trip-based model, where they looked at all the different stops you made on one trip, um, that completely changed the output of the model. But the net, the net effect of that in general is that more projects would trigger the threshold. Um, I, go, go ahead, Sarah. Um, so it's true that the new SCAG model is calculating VMT slightly differently. However, all projects are compared to a consistent baseline, right? So the SCAG baseline used to be here, let's say. Now the baseline's a little bit higher, but your project is also using that new model. So it's still, it's an apples to apples comparison. Everything's a little bit higher in the new model. So the project might have a little bit higher VMT, but the baseline is also a little bit higher. So projects are not expected to be more or less impacted because of the new model. Oh, Just I a see. new way of calculating okay, the VMT. Thank you. Anything further? So I thought the bar exam was tough. <laughs> kind of pales in comparison to what you just been saying for the last 15 minutes. Yeah. So, and you should see it skag when you have 88 members no, plus I think I'd want to trying to that. discuss this. So the bottom line for me in this is basically we've chosen these numbers so it's less likely to uh, to trigger this threshold that yeah. we're talking about. Yes, sir. So and that's Absolutely. a good thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I don't have anything further, so... Unless there's anything it. further, I'm ready um, to entertain just, a motion. Just perhaps oh, a, yeah, just perhaps just a small plan. clarification go question ahead. is already in the, the, the Mr. Cook's uh, email to us. But the 15%, mm -hmm. how did that come about? Yeah. So uh, just really quickly in that table, you saw 15% used under each scenario. 15% um, is not a number that we really should or could change. Um, that's a number that's specified by the state. Um, so the state has given us formal direction to use 15% below the, to set a threshold. But we were able yeah. to pick and choose. The, the region. The yeah. regions. Yeah, we do have that flexibility. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Unless there's anything further, I will entertain a motion. Who wants to take a shot sure. at this one? Sure. Uh, Mr. Go Mayor, ahead. I'll 
move that we adopt resolution number 24-5727, adopting the revised thresholds of significance for impacts related to vehicle miles traveled of projects in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and finds that the adoption of new CEQA thresholds of significance is exempt from CEQA. Thank you. We have a second? Second. Thank you. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Chen? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yu? Yes. Mayor Chavez? Yes. We're having a technical right. difficulty. Thank you, Director Rima. Okay, we will now move on to item B, the reprogramming of the city's year one and year two permanent local housing allocation funding and the approval of consultant services agreement with family promise of San Gabriel Valley to administer a program to assist families and individuals experiencing or at risk of homelessness. <clears throat> um, City Manager Cook. Thank you, Mayor Chavez and members of the council. Before you tonight, as per the direction of the council to reevaluate the permanent local housing allocation program. Uh, we had gone through uh, iteration about a year plus ago looking at some improvements similar to our CDBG program where we would provide improvements for people who were disabled um, and, and needed some improvements. We found that the CDBG program was fitting that need and with some of the requirements of the program, it became somewhat problematic. So we made a pivot. Council authorized us to do a notice of availability to the, uh, to the nonprofit community to provide services to those who are on at risk of homelessness to provide them with similar things to what we did during uh, COVID where we received allocations for re rental assistance for those during COVID time during the pandemic who were out of a job couldn't make rent kept them in their homes to keep them safe in this case the permanent local housing allocation which is the state funding that comes that we need to spend um, would enable us to do a similar type program with with a qualified nonprofit and uh, we had two responses and we're recommending Family Promise who has extensive experience throughout the San Gabriel Valley uh, providing those resources both from a counseling standpoint, a financial literacy standpoint to help people who are on the brink of homelessness. Uh, we'll be in additional conversations with Temple City Unified, and Mr. Gullick will go over that in, in just a moment, to really identify those families and those, and those individuals who are on the brink of homelessness and keeping them housed um, in concert with what uh, the council is looking for in, in, one, in preventing homelessness is one of our key goals. So with that, Mayor Chavez, if I may, I'll turn it over to Mr. Gullick. Thank you. Mr. Gullick, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Council members, members of the audience. Um, as Mr. Cook mentioned previously, on uh, December 5th, this was heard by the City Council, um, directed staff to reprogram the fund, the PLHA funds to assisting uh, families experiencing homelessness or at risk. Uh, city issued an RFP, the city received two proposals, and then um, the city published a 30-day notice to close out the previously uh, approved programs with the PLHA funds and to establish uh, new programs. Uh, the city staff looked at the proposals based on four criteria, the overall costs, the firm experience, the project team expertise and experience, and then also the conciseness of the proposal. Uh, Family Promise did provide a, a detailed budget to expend the funds by the deadline, which is December 31st, 2024. Um, they also included in their proposal uh, information on how they're going to uh, work with the clients in uh, working towards stability and self-sufficiency. Uh, we've also reached out to other jurisdictions that they have worked with. Uh, City of Rosemead has provided a positive recommendation as well as the San Gabriel Valley uh, Council of Go Governments. Um, their proposal also included a temporary shelter um, item, but that item was de determined um, ineligible by uh, the Los Angeles County Development Authority. Uh, so that was removed from their budget. 
Um, so they have uh, two agreements tonight or two budgets uh, move in and rental assistance program, uh, which they estimate would be able to assist up to 13 families. Uh, the minimum is six months of assistance per the PLHA uh, program. That number could, the number of families assisted could actually uh, be reduced and uh, additional assistance could be um, done. So if we get, say, 10 families, then they could possibly get um, seven or eight months of assistance. So it really depends on the number of families that are eligible for the program. Uh, the, and then also the, the budget that was submitted, they estimate that five families would be, um, could be assisted with one-time move-in assistance. So that include application fees, uh, security deposits, first and last month's rent, and then also um, furniture would be an eligible cost. Uh, Mr. Gillick, do you mind if I yes. just interject real quick? And I know we have time for council questions, but sometimes it's easier when it's in front of you and you just want to ask something, so if you don't mind. Yeah. So when you re refer to rental assistance, is that, does that mean that, uh, that this budget will, will pay the full amount of the rent, or does the renter have to throw some in as well? Or is that on an individual basis? I believe there are some requirements where the... Um, the family would need to provide some type of assistance. So um, they would have to combine. Correct. They would have to provide some of their own funds, not just rely totally on what they're going to be receiving correct. from this program. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then the second component of the proposal was the case management. So it would be one full-time and one part-time uh, staff member to administer the programs, and that would be working with the clients, um, not just... Um, kind of setting everything up for them, and it's really kind of going through and explaining everything, and Family Promise could possibly expand on that. Um, but, you know, they, they really focus on providing that collaborative, collaborative approach with the clients, educate them about financial literacy, um, and then set, having, you know, providing them with support and setting a goals, goals that are achievable. And then they also um, have included uh, program marketing and outreach. Um, they do have limited um, uh, funding or capital, so they did request in, uh, an advancement of $50,000, um, so that has been included in the, the budget as well. And that's for both? both for both of the programs, so combined. Um, there would be no fiscal impact uh, for this action. These funds, are, again, are funded from the PLHA funds. Uh, there wouldn't be an impact to this year or next year's uh, budget since the funds need to be expended by the end of the calendar year. Uh, the city would be reimbursed uh, by LACDA for these funds. And we did, re we did receive some news, and we did get a bulletin today from LACDA that there, that may in fact be somewhat extended, but we'll we'll have more information for you on that. But that is really essentially it is a pool of funds that we tap into, we expend, we go to LACDA, they reimburse us back, and they have an allocation of what funding we have available. Extend past 2024. Be extend past uh, December 31st, 2024. So we'll get more. That's going to be one of my questions. Is what happens in 2025? So we, in 2024, so this one, years in one and two, we have the uh, the total amount of available funding that right. LACDA is holding you know, for Temple City that we can get reimbursed for for the programs that uh, Family Promise administers and the benefits they provide. Um, at the if, and if we don't use that total amount, that would go into the large back into the larger state pot of, for LACDA yeah, in the losing. state. So we, would, we wouldn't be, per, per, in per se, losing money, but our goal is to, if someone has allocated us a certain amount of money, we want to be able to utilize it. But we're going to rely on the expertise of our consultants, uh, Family Promise, to really know what's out there in the community. We have an idea of what the needs are. We're going to work with Temple City Unified School District as one of our partners to identify those families who are at risk so that we'll know, I think, but... We'll come back to you with some progress reports as well, or I'll provide those in my city manager's report to you as well to just kind of give you an idea. Hey, the first three months, we already helped six families and we're ramping up or three months. It's been a little bit touch and go. We'll see where that goes. But this and this and this what this does is enabled us to use that fund with a qualified, well-established partner that go 
who works in the surrounding community and can provide this uh, going forward for the future years i mean this is this is our test case in going forward with this program we haven't done a program like this before i would Mr. Gullick and Mr. Reimers did an excellent job during COVID with our rental assistance program. This is a bit different, though. It is a, a, it is a, a lot more of, a, of what I would call a wraparound service program with the financial literacy helping these individuals, you know, pr provide for that gap that they need to keep their housing, um, but also helping them with financial literacy and other services that they need to provide. So. We'll know we'll know how it's working, you know, three, four, six months. So for your question, Mayor, for 2025, theoretically, you know, if things are moving forward and at a, at a good pace, um, we would come back to you with a pos you know, with an amendment uh, for this service for another year as well. And when will we know what the funding will be for 2025? I don't. Is I think I'm not sure, Mr. Gullick. Do you know when they have a schedule, when the funding is available, or what the funding schedule is? It's we, kind of hard to enter into an agreement if we don't know what we're going to be using to agree with. Yeah, our year three funding. We know the amount, um, which it would be two hundred fifty-four thousand six hundred twenty. That would need to be expend, ex expended by the end of twenty twenty-five. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Does that conclude your report? Uh, yeah, so just the recommendation would be to close out the previously fund, um, PLHA funded program, the Residential Assistance Modification Program, we called it RAMP, and establish the two new programs, approve the two agreements with Family Promise to administer the new programs, and then allow the, or authorize the city manager to execute the two agreements. All right, and, and representatives and the executive director from Family Promises here. I think you saw you met her before. Or yes. Four of the council members had met her before. So, thank you. Okay, well, why don't we start with council questions? And why don't we start to my right, Council Member Sternquist? Are there any questions at this time? A couple of questions on the program. Can you go back to the previous slide that shows the two programs? In the rental move in and, and move in assistance program. Now, when they're given the assistance to, you know, given the deposit and then this, the application fee, first and last month rent, security deposit, furniture, et cetera, who get, say they decide to, to leave the family after five or six months relocates out of the area, out of state, who who gets that security deposit back? Does it go back to Family Promise? Thank you. And, and is it for a rental in Temple City? It is for a, my name is Lenita Tatami, first of all. I'm the Good executive evening. director for Family Promise San Gabriel Valley and all the monies is spent in Temple City. Um, we have not had that occurrence where when we've provided um, move-in cost or rental assistance for a family that they have moved out in a, in a six month period. They are pretty much set in that apartment because they have children. They have some ties to this community. Their children are in school here. So I'm not sure uh, how to really answer that because we never had someone just move out on us. Would the money come back to us? Probably not. We would probably have to do some kind of agreement with the landlord that says if this family moves out and everything is okay with the apartment, then please re refund the money to us. That in turn, we will refund it to you. Maybe we could work something out in that manner. So is the rental agreement with the family themselves? and the landlord the Part rental agreement is with the family and the landlord the money goes to the landlord it does not go to the family okay thank you similar to like what we did with the cdbg program so there are from a contractual standpoint um that agreement is still that rental agreement between us and or the the renter and the and the uh, landlord, landlord. Mm -hmm. but we provide that documentation that we had extensive documentation that would be required. And on, frankly, 
LACDA will be auditing us as well <laughs> through this process, similar to the way they audit us through our CDBG program, which we have received clean audits from for the last 10 plus years. So um, there'll be an eye on this as well. So, so then the goal would be that the, through the vetting process that you would pick families who had some where you would have a sense that there was some stability long term, that if they were assisted for six month period, that they had some means to continue on their own correct paying rent. Correct. And so and that would happen during that vetting correct. process. Correct. The okay. maximum we're going to provide is up to two thousand dollars. And so we would require them to put in some money because they need to be vested into this process as well. If we're doing it all for them, right. it's not going to be as as they won't feel as part of it as if they're having to put in their own money as well so we will pay up to two thousand we will work with them on a monthly basis i don't know if you all know about the homeless management information system hmis we report to that so that we know what's going on there's other services that are available that that family can also be able to be provided with and so we have a collaboration with LASA Union Station that we work with. So there's wraparound services for a family that comes into our organization for um, assistance. And at that six month period, say for, for whatever reason, they're still struggling. Mm -hmm. What happens at that point with that family? There are other service providers out there that um, we could connect them with. Okay. Um, maybe there's affordable housing. They may not be in affordable housing. This may be market rent rate right. that is that they're in. And so we have also partnerships with affordable housing providers that maybe they may need to move to an affordable housing unit that will be able to help them better pay their rent and be able to afford where they're at. And you'd probably know that by month three or four, Correct. how they were going to plan for that. I Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's and we all. also look at you know their employment, where they where they're at. Are they right. gainfully employed? Are they looking for employment? We would work with them on their their skills. You know, kind of just do the wraparound. Maybe do mock interviews with them, resume planning. That's going to be part of what we do. That's included in the wraparound services with the family. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Mann, any questions? Yes, uh, actually uh, it might be more for family promise, so th okay. thank you for, for okay. answering our questions. Might as well just stay yeah. up there for a okay. while. Uh, <laughs> uh, I heard mention of collaboration mm -hmm. with our school district and other local partners. Can you get us a, give us a sense of what that looks like and what has worked for you in your work with other cities and school districts? Sure, I can tell you about your school district. I've been working with Daryl Topian. He- to to Topalian. Yes, thank you for correcting me. And I did a presentation with them um, a couple of weeks ago before they went on um, break. And so I presented to all their counselors. Um, a family has been in our shelter from Temple City Unified School District that was in our shelter for approximately 30 days and she was able to be there and she needed to stay there until she could get back to Texas. She did move back to Texas where her family was, but we do have a relationship with Temple City Unified School District. I got a call from another counselor um, just before they went on Easter vacation of a family that's in need. So we do have that relationship with them already. So that is something that is solid. So if I hear correctly, the the nexus is really that the district has to I help you identify potential candidates in order for you to vet them or? The district will help us. We, the homeless, um, the Temple City Homeless Coalition has, has also forwarded someone to us that before we even receive this grant, we help them with um, move-in assistance. So we've already helped a family from Temple City that needed to be have moving assistance. So we have relationships with some of the nonprofits that serve Temple City residents. So it's just not the school district. That is one place that families will come from that we will be vetting, but they come from various places that are here in Temple City. And we will be outreaching and doing with, the, with some of the churches. We did a, a presentation at the um, Homeless Coalition, Julie, our president of the board, we went and we pr did a presentation. So we have that relationship here in Temple City already. And um, we're working with Pastor Martin, the church right here. Um, so we have relationships throughout Temple City. 
we are just ready to go. Okay, great, thank, thank okay. you. My, and my, my next question, I'm not sure who would answer this, but it seems like there's, a, there's obviously a finite pool of money from PLHA. Do we know if other cities or agencies, I guess, fund such programs with monies beyond PLHA? Like, let's say if there's great success in a certain program and it's proven, it's documented, et cetera. I mean, here we're looking at 13 families with rental assistance for six months and five families. And it just seems like a very small impact. I mean, it's still better than none, right? Um, do we know if other cities have gone beyond just using PLHA money to continue funding these programs? Or because I'm I'm thinking, you know, with with all the talk about homelessness and prevention, and there's a lot of talk about well, where are cities getting their share of Measure H money? Right. Is there a nexus between other funding sources that can supplement? this in the future. I, I'm kind of thinking a little bit ahead, but I'm just kind of curious if it's just limited to the small pool or is there something kind of larger? Could CDBG funds yeah. be used well, for this? One of the possible sources would be community development block grant funds. Um, the council has an ad hoc committee that's looking at possibly reprogramming some of those funds. And that's something that we can look at. Um, thankfully, under LACDA, if we ask them who has a program that does such and such, they have a system where they can tell us um, is there someone who has temporary rental assistance programmed? And then we can look at their guidelines and get a sense for there. So that's, that's research we can yeah, do. Okay. Yeah, but, but the first thing that pops to my mind is CDBG because it's really focused on low and moderate income okay. residents. Is there any nexus to measure H? Mm -hmm. Not, well, yeah, yes, in, in theory, there is a new measure that's supplementing Measure H that's coming out that will actually provide more direct funding, and I'm not, and that's that's more of a political issue at the, at, at the moment. But in terms of the direct funding for Measure H, no, there's not a direct allocation to us. The existing funding that we get from Measure H is with Lakata right now, who provides the emergency services to those who wish to utilize that emer those emergency services, but Measure H, there's not a direct funnel of funding that could do this type of program that would come directly to Temple City. Okay, and then you kind of read my mind about my next question was, is there, where does, does Lakata fit anywhere in this picture in relation to them, or are they just kind of two completely different groups that they're providing uh, services for? If I was to generally speak about what Lakata does is they are dealing with an acute level of those who are experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Family Promise is dealing with individuals who are on the brink. So I, I, I'm sorry to say it crudely, but they're, they're dealing with some different types of clientele. If we'll, we'll make sure and we'll talk to uh, Family Promise about having the connection between Lakata to see if they can identify that person or that individual who is experiencing homelessness that may be kind of crossing that, you know, crossing that Rubicon to maybe accepting not just more assistance, but are, as you know, they've got, they've got them into a place, they've straightened out some things and maybe this can, PLHA funding can help them take that next step from, you know, I'm in a shelter to I'm now renting a place. Yeah, because yeah, I, I think that's an important narrative that we need to kind of understand or, or get a better grasp on. Because I think from, in general, perhaps parts of the community kind of look at homelessness as this one broad category or, or one general category, whereas there's actually very distinct mm -hmm. categories with different needs yes. and different challenges. Sure so I think for us to, what, what I liked to uh, seeing from the staff report was the part about outreach and engagement. So I think um, I'm kind of, jumping ahead of comments a little bit, but uh, I think one of my sort of uh, rhetorical questions or, or things to think about is uh, keeping us aware of what that entails 
and what role we as the city can play in being more active in, in that aspect. So, and, and, and Council Member Mayor, what I would, although I was gonna bring that up later, uh, we still have our city-based homeless plan standing committee. I think that's something that we can look into further to answer some of those questions. Uh, that's a good and point. And look into those things as well. I, I concur. That's Tom, a good is, point. was that Fernando? Yeah, that, okay, so we need to. Get you on. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. So, thank you. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, you, any questions at this time? Uh, mine is really general. Um, what's our plan after funding 25, 2025? What's, what does that look like? I mean, that was a question. I was going to take it back on you, Mayor. Yeah. It's a good question, Mayor Pro Tem. You, um, I think, uh, assuming, and we have no indication that the funding source from the state for PLHA will go away at any time soon. So we can look at this as an ongoing uh, pool of resources that the city can tap into now and into the future as well. So I. You know, obviously this is our first go around with this program, but I think the council can look towards multiple years out of this, that funding source being available for this, for this service. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Chen. Okay, before you speak, I have to apologize because you will learn that sometimes when you're the last person called upon, all the good questions have been asked <laughs> and we take it all up. So from now on, I'll try to give you a chance to go first, but I want you to understand too that you can jump in at any time. Okay, so with that said, go ahead. Do you have any Thank questions? You, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just more of a comment. I think uh, Council Member Matt uh, brought a very good, insightful perspective about the different populations of homelessness. And, and uh, uh, I looked at Family Bombs online and I see that you're with big presence, uh, not just here locally, but I uh, want to thank the Executive Ghost for taking time of being here uh, so that there is a Face to face, knowing that there's a local uh, uh, nature that great to hear about the thing to uh, the school district. Is your mic on? There you go. Oh, now it's <laughs> okay. It's okay. We all do this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Man. Thank you. Okay. Unless there's anyone else, um, I don't. Would you? Oh wait, that's me. I forgot. I just call on myself. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm assuming that this program will also help families maybe who have lost their jobs and now they're on that brink. Do you have any of those type of clientele that maybe were doing well and now have experienced issues within the program, within their family life? Yes, we do. We have had experience with um, families who have uh, had income and then all of a sudden they've lost it right. and they're in need of some assistance. That's where our case management comes in. Great. We have extremely good case managers. Uh, one is an MSW, so she is, um, and one is an LCSW. So we have very good case managers that work with families that are in crisis mode to help them to um, do resumes. We work with families to do resumes. We work with them to even locate jobs. So we. It's, when we say wrap around, we mean wrap around. Perfect. And so, yes. Yeah, my last question is, I'm assuming that you take confidentiality very seriously when yes. these types of things come up. Yes. Um, especially in dealing with families in the school district. And Absolutely. Like that. Okay. Absolutely. Great. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I have. So with that, I will now open up the public hearing. Does anyone in the audience wish to speak on this matter? not seen or hearing anyone, I will close <coughs> public hearing and we will entertain any final questions or comments by council. And why don't we start now with council member Chen. Any final questions or comments? That was thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, you? Uh, no further comments. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, council member Mann? I just wanna say, I think this is a, a, a great I guess uh, I don't want to call it a pilot program, but it's it is something new. So I'm glad we're trying it, and I'm glad we're doing it, and I'm I'm excited to see what the results are. Uh, so as I alluded to earlier, uh, the the outreach and the engagement and the collaboration. I'm hoping there can be some kind of a progress report for. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right word. <laughs> Um, but at least some kind of a report back to us so we kind of know how that's going. Uh, and at least that gives us a glimpse of um, hopefully success stories in our community. So 
Thank you. Not, not a problem. Thank you. Council Member Sternquist. I just want to say um, thank you so much for the work that you all do with Family Promise. Um, I think it's a great program, and um, whenever you're working with families that are in crisis, as you know, it's always challenging, and the immediacy of the need is always just, you know, it's there, and, and you want to help, and if you don't have the funding to do that, there's a lot of people that you you just cannot help. So I'm grateful for this funding, and I think it's something that um, the mayor and I can definitely look at when we discuss the CDBG funding that we're going to be talking at our ad hoc to ma hopefully maybe supplement it. So thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I would echo my uh, fellow council members' uh, um, statements. Uh, I think this is a, a good start to a program that's new to the city, but at the same time mm -hmm. that we've tried to look for some solutions and do the things that we can in this very large area of uh, that affects many people, not only in our city, but obviously throughout the county. Um, my only concern is that, have you seen what the rental values are in Temple City? <laughs> so that's gonna be a little challenging perhaps as well, but they are relatively high, at least last time I looked, but uh, we'll have to just deal with that. And, that, and that's why I think, we, and I, I hear that my fellow council members saying the same thing, that maybe there's an opportunity to, to look at other funding sources and others to supplement this program and, and, and make it a, a program that will certainly help those that reside in our city and, and, and want to remain here. So, um, is, is, uh, I, I read in the news that there's a, currently an audit of the Measure H funds. Am, am I correct in that? Uh, have you heard anything about that, uh, Brian? There is a significant amount of activity related to LASA, the agency, the city county agency and some of the use of measure h um there's a lot of <laughs> balls in the air with that right now yeah, so it kind of concerns me a little but, bit but the good thing about this this is the state funding that comes directly to us through through so we're not dependent oh, on man. measure h or anything else for this funding so it's a source of stability not only for for family promise it's a source of stability for us in knowing we can at least deliver the service for Although this that period could of time be a potential source of funding at some point maybe but right now it's not that there. right now there's not a direct mm -hmm. allocation of right. funds from measure think, h yeah. to do these types of programs and uh, address that as well okay okay well um that's all i have so uh who would like to take this motion on it's a quite lengthy one but <laughs> we could put it back on our screen yeah <laughs> you know per okay. perhaps we could, ahead, could uh, just you. could probably we just uh, as, move as, that we approve staff's recommendation yes, we could, yeah. that's easy six of them stephanie is saying yes so we <laughs> yes. can do that okay so Thank we have you. a motion uh, motion uh mr mayor i move that we um, approve the six recommendations in the staff report okay. tonight Thank second you. Thank, you. Thank you all right uh Madam Clerk, can we have a roll call, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chen? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yu? Yes. Mayor Chavez? Yes. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Adam and Scott and all our friends from the uh, family and housing. So thank you very much and more to follow. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, we will now move to. Uh, Item number nine, unfinished business. There is none. And we'll now move to item 10, new business, approved resolution 24-5728, authoriz authorizing budget amendments for the ARPA fund. Uh, Very briefly, Mayor. Manager Cook. Thank you, Mayor Chavez and members of the council. Before you tonight is the effort to ensure that we safeguard the ARPA funds that uh, we received um, during the uh, process of the pandemic and uh, the funds that were helped were allocated to cities nationwide. So what we'll be doing is from an accounting perspective, a kind of a revenue in revenue out, um, but also can, we will continue to track that funding. So what our concern has been going forward is, be, is with the projects that you have approved so far, 
we've had some very good bids come in <laughs> and some of those bids would be saving money which in most cases when we fund something from the from general fund reserves we're all happy right we're like okay we're not going to spend that much general fund reserves in this case with the arpa funding if we do not use it we will lose it so we're what so what this mechanism allows us to do is to go back and actually accrue the expenses eligible expenses allowed under ARPA for public safety services and essentially that essentially puts that into a signed fund balance so we will be continuing to track this funding we will contract we will track it individually as a line item and assign fund balance and even if the federal government comes back and the u.s treasury comes back they'll see that this one was an eligible expense but as we we're spending down that money over time they'll be able to see they'll be able to track the projects that we spent that were El arpa eligible drawing down off assigned fund balance so this protects that funding from now until past uh, december of 2024 <laughs> and so we're not in jeopardy of a project that comes in let's say five percent under what we budgeted we won't lose that five percent but with that mayor chavez i'll turn it over to our uh, admin services director and city treasurer thank you director Paragas. it's all yours good evening mayor mayor pro tem council members so tonight really is trying to spend all of our arpa funds so resolution number 24 57 28 will authorize two budget amendments, um, funds coming from the ARPA funds and being used into the general fund of 6372140 The second budget amendment will be the transferred the other way for the public safety expenditures such as the sheriff's contracts costs. And we're requesting 5705165 And this would cover the full year of fiscal year 2023 and 24. The third um, recommendation is the balance from um, the ARPA funds that are unspent as of July 1, 2023 is 2329350 And we'd like to have council direct us to use that remaining funds for next year's budget, 2024-2025, and spend it on the public safety expenditures, such as the sheriff's costs. And by November, uh, by the billing of the sheriff's uh, of November 2024, we would have spent all of our ARPA allocation of the almost $8.6 million. So that's the goal tonight with this adoption of the resolution. And then lastly, as Mr. Cook uh, mentioned, we would assign the total of two and three, which is 8034515 and basically put that aside for the current projects and any new future projects the council would wish to approve into using those funds towards completing those other projects. So you know, visually, this is what it would look like. Um, our ARPA budget has the full, uh, ARPA fund has the full $6 million in it. We would move that over to the general fund. And then the other way is the $5,705,000 going to the ARPA fund. And what that would do is the adjusted budget for the ARPA fund would be 5,705,165 for fiscal year 23-24. And then the general fund would be amended to 18,341,360. So you see that blue piece of pie? That's the sheriff's cost that we're, we'll be proposing to move to the ARPA fund. The recommendation number three, again, is moving the balance which is an estimate, of course, for, towards the 24-25 budget, which is in the process right now of we're um, trying to complete. So um, by doing that, and again, like I mentioned, November 2024 is when we expect to fully spend that $8,566,000. And that way we avoid sending any money back. And then number four, again, um, reserving that $8 million for these previously funded ARPA projects and any new projects council would like to fund. And with that, um, we'd like you to adopt resolution 24-5728. Any questions? Do we have any questions from council at this time? 
No. Question. Yes. You have a question? Go ahead. One, one, one quick question. Uh, Director Paragas, I assume this mechanism of transferring has been done before by other cities or agencies? Yes. We spoke with our auditors just to confirm that um, it's, it's a viable way to do it because government services includes public safety services. So um, our auditor has mentioned most of our clients are doing that, is using it for their public safety costs. Okay. That way, again, no money is sent back to the U.S. Treasury. And they're mostly a lot of the agencies that are our size, too, mm -hmm. so that because we're under that $10, $10 million threshold, which allowed us to take the revenue loss as receiving the funds and then expending them in this way as well. But again, what's going to be most important is that um, we will be tracking this along with the auditors as well so that if, say, the Treasury comes back and said, okay, I saw you do this, show us an assigned fund balance exactly where that money was, show us an assigned fund balance exactly where you drew down off the, uh, the ARPA-approved projects, we will be able to demonstrate that. We will be able to demonstrate that both in our general ledger and our accounting system. We'll be able to demonstrate that in the budget process as well. So that's clear to everybody what, what was done. So are we locked into actually spending this money for public safety? Or let's say we decide um, we need it somewhere else. Can well, we you're, 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 you're spending it for public safety now. Right. now. You're reserving it, <laughs> that $8 million, for the existing projects that you've already approved mm -hmm. and the remaining balance that you haven't approved yet. So I guess the answer is yes, you can. Yes, you, you can. can. Money, yeah. Okay. And it is an accounting mechanism that we're using in this manner, but it's a allowed mechanism. Okay. Right. Uh, any other questions at this time? If not, uh, I will open public comment. Uh, Mayor, I just oh, want to ask a clar uh, clarification question, just 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 so that folks can hear it. Um, the, I mean, this is a great way to transfer, so we don't lose any ARPA funding, but. I think city manager and then also director Parkus, this this fund transfer mechanism is something that we know will be approved down the road by uh, by the feds, right? Yeah, we, we know we, we and we have confirmed yes. this with our auditors as well. In fact, um, there's a report that's due this month mm -hmm. to the U.S. Treasury that we have to show how we're spending it or how we're planning to spend it. So, so with this approval tonight, I would report that we're spending, spending it for the public safety services. So that first half, that $5.7 mm -hmm. at the end of this month is actually going to be reported to the Treasury. Why we can't do the actual transfer just yet because it has to do with the 24-25 budget, you would give us the direction to do that when we present to you the 24-25 budget. So the, Fed, the feds are already going to see this $5.7 million transfer. Right. Okay. That's it. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody from the public? Jerry, you want to say anything? All right. So I'm going to close the public comments. Any final questions or comments by council members? A comment. Go ahead. I, I just think it's it's been such a wonderful opportunity to be on council and have this ARPA funding come to our city because it's been such a joy in spending it for the community with more to come. So if there was anything good that came out of COVID, it was, and being a small city because we weren't, I think it was over a certain population, then you didn't have the flexibility to, to spend it the way that you would like. There were more restrictions. So I think if there was anything good that came out, municipalities were able to invest back in their communities with this funding. And that old saying, always a silver lining somewhere, right? Somewhere. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, then... Uh, just, just one quick ahead. comment. I just want to comment, uh, um, Mr. City Manager, um, uh, Director Pargas, for and, and your staff, City Attorney as well, for you know, making sure that we're spending every last penny of the ARPA funding and not sending anything back. And you know, um, 
this is a great move, and I really appreciate what you guys are doing yeah. tonight. City Attorney did review this as well, so yes. just. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Mayor Chavez, yes, I, if I can also say, yeah, just to echo Council Member or Mayor Pro Tem Yu's uh, comment, I think it's great that I always talk about alignment of staff with city values. This is a great example of it. I mean, we always pride ourselves as being fiscally responsible, and this is exactly aligned with that. So thank you. Yep. And just to kind of well, you know, put on top of that too. We, I'm proud of the fact that we have staff that, are pretty smart, and they figure these things out. And uh, you know, that certainly makes our job a lot easier. I think to, uh, to be able to approve these type of things because, you guys have thought these out well and, crossed your T's and dotted your I's and done everything that's necessary. So, thank you all for doing that. And, uh, and of course, uh, Brian. Uh, uh, doing a great job as well with uh, overseeing these things, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we will uh, entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve staff recommendation one through four. Okay, that seems to be the new way of doing things, I guess. It's I'll much quicker. It is much quicker. I tried that, but you, you guys didn't like it. I'll second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, can we have a roll call, please? Council Member Chen? Yes. Councilmember Mann? Yes. Councilmember Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Proteng Yu? Yes. Mayor Chavez? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we will now move to item 11, update from our city manager, Mr. Cook. Uh, real quickly, um, Mr. Jambazian noted it in his invocation, but I gotta thank park staff for really moving on a dime. <laughs> And uh, when I heard the number 800, I didn't believe him at first. But um, when Adam told me as well, Mr. Tempezian reported it, several hundred, I, I, I was shocked and ha happily surprised as well. So that was great job by our Parks and Recs team who do a great job of pivoting. And they've done that throughout the year that I think in the state of the city presented by um, Council Member Mann, you know, we really adjusted back to a new normal. We're very events driven community, uh, parks and recreation department. And you can see it in the level of engagement and the level of activity we're seeing. Uh, you know, we're that focal point of the community, be it Lunar New Year, Easter, Camellia Festival, all of these programs and events that we do both internally here, but with our partners throughout the community. That's really something that I'm very proud of and continue forward with as alluding to a prior state of the city. Uh, uh, Mayor, Pro Tem, Mayor Pro Tem, you called us the little engine that could, and we are that in many ways. Um, thank you again to Scott and the team. Thank you to Adam. We're really excited about the Family Promise program. It really aligns with, I think, where, where the council was going from a homeless prevention standpoint, and we found a really good partner. And so hopefully um, either myself or Scott will report back to you in an email if that uh, deadline's been extended or we have some flexibility along those lines to uh, adjust up or not worry about the harder deadlines. But again, it's not like we're losing money and we're, we have it budgeted now. It's a, it's a reimbursement process with um, our partners at LACDA. Um, lastly, um, well, you know, one of the things you know I've been working on is the five-year agreement for law enforcement services with LA County. Um, and maybe we may be doing a few road shows here with our contract cities throughout, but we do have a couple more meetings that we're having with our county partners and hopefully bringing something to the board um, in the next uh, month and a half. That's Great. it, Mayor Chavez. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, update from our city attorney. Uh, do we have any updates? <laughs> Nothing specific, as always. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you for filling in. You always do a great job, so thank you. Keep us in line. Okay, uh, we will now move to item 13, council reports regarding ad hoc or standing committee meetings. First of all, I'll ask if there are any uh, reports from anyone. I don't think so. Um, before we leave this item, I do want to go over um, and identify the current delegates to the standing committees and the ad hoc committees, and at the same time, in going through these, 
um, I've decided to uh, dissolve a couple of them uh, unless there's any objection to that um, and also um, keep one that I was going to dissolve but it changed my mind so first of all the school district city standing committee will remain council member Mann and myself uh, the facilities Public Works and Infrastructure Standing Committee will remain Mayor Pro Tem Yu and Council Member Mann. The Audit Standing Committee will consist of myself and Mayor Pro Tem Yu. I initially was going to disband the city based homeless plan standing committee because I thought that with our, the, the uh, work that we did tonight as far as approving our agreement with Family Promise. It would kind of take the place of that, but then I started thinking and discussing with Brian that maybe this is a good time to actually keep this in place to kind of not oversee it, but do anything we can or make any recommendations and also to look into other funding sources that have been mentioned today regarding that. So that will remain. Uh, I will be replacing uh, Council Member Viscara and, uh, and Council Member Sternkus will remain on that. Uh, on that committee as well. Uh, ad hoc committees, uh, Primos Park Element, I think that's pretty much done, if I believe. There's a, maybe a couple little things to follow up on. Just but Minor, but I think the direction has been there. So yeah. unless uh, Mayor unless, per time you feels... Are you okay yeah. with dissolving yeah, yeah. that? Okay, Absolutely. so we're going to dissolve yeah. that one. Um, and also the Centennial Celebration Ad Hoc Committee is... is we've, we've been going for a long time with the <laughs> celebration and Talking with Adam, uh, I think this last go around with the uh, with the Homestead House, they said was a pretty much the last planned event. So uh, unless something else comes up, we'll go ahead and and dissolve that uh, Centennial Celebration Ad Hoc Committee at this time. It's been a great year, and a lot of uh, you know kudos to uh, to our Parks and Rec Department and Director and everyone else that's helped with that. Of course, our, our Historical Society as well. And Paul Pitzer, Paul Spitzeri. From, from Homestead. Homestead as well, did a great job. So, Tom, yes, do we have a liaison to the historical society? I don't believe we do. But now that we give um, them some funding, maybe we. Well, we um, we could yeah we could look into that to do a liaison with the uh, um, next one. We'll bring that up at probably okay. the next meeting if that's okay. Okay, bless you. And. Um, so, so those two are going to be dissolving the future development of city property at Las Tunas Drive. Uh, that's going to remain at Council Member Mann and Council Member Sternquist. The Las Tunas Drive Streetscape Ad Hoc Committee, that will consist of Mayor Pro Tem Yu and Council Member Chen. And then, as mentioned before, the CDBG Funds Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, we'll be meeting, uh, I believe, a week from this. Is it this Friday or next Friday? Next Friday. Next Friday. Uh, Council Member Sternquist and myself. So that'll be it, and then um, uh, we'll move forward with that. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we'll move to item 14, council items separate from the city manager's regular agenda. And I will start with Council Member Chen. Do you have anything that you would like to add tonight? I don't, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Well, I want to say thank you. Uh, um, I hope your experience at your first meeting was all you would hope for. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank okay. you, Mr. Mayor. All right. well, thank you. Okay. Council Member Mann. Uh, yes, a few things, Mayor Chavez. Sure, go ahead. Well, first, I, I do want to thank Council Member Chen for taking over as the uh, liaison with the Chamber of Commerce. And I think it's a great fit because he was, he also served on the board previously. So mm -hmm. he was part of the team that you know, took the leadership role of transforming the chamber to what it is now. So, so thank you <coughs> for, for taking that over. I think you'll do a fantastic job. Uh, secondly, I, because at our last reorg, we didn't really want to spend time to report out, but I did want to mention that the new pickleball courts are, they're phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, I think a, a few of us were there when, the, uh, the local groups had their kind of own ribbon cutting slash kickoff ceremony. Uh, this was, I think, the Friday right before reorg. I, I don't know, you were, you were there. We got to play, Fernando. Brian played. I was there. And, 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 and Mayor Chavez was there. was there. So, and then I played my first pickleball match. 
And I think they let me win, so I, <laughs> I don't think that counted. They let me win. They, oh, they did? No. Oh, okay. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, um, the feedback was, was great. Uh, it ra unfortunately rained and cut it short a little bit, but uh, it's a great group, and they're already talking about trying to expand, but I said, uh, let, let's, let's take it uh, you know, a step at a time here. Let's, let's evaluate how, how things go. But uh, I, I, I want to thank Parks and Rec staff, because they had nothing but great things to say the group had nothing but great things to say about our staff and how helpful they were during the pilot program as well as how quickly the courts were put together and installed. And so they're, they're being heavily used. So that was great to see. And I guess on a more uh, somber note, um, earlier just today, we, we found out that our uh, sister city, Hualien County, uh, experienced a magnitude 7.4 earthquake. Um, I've reached out to them personally, but they're in the middle of crisis uh, kind of response mode right now. Um, right before the meeting, I know Mayor Chavez showed me a picture of, um, I, I think it, you said it was from Hualien, right? Yeah, from Hualien. Uh, I think LA Times, mm -hmm. was it? LA Times. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they had some buildings collapse. So, I mean, the area is very seismically active. So we know, I mean, they know that this is not, I mean, I don't want to say it's not a surprise, but a 7.4 is nothing to, to sneeze at. I think the report said this was their strongest earthquake since 1990 or something. 1990? Okay. So it's, yeah, it, it's a big one. So um, we'll do our outreach, and I know Mayor Chavez, we, we had talked right before, but perhaps I'll, I'll leave the other item to you. But I would like to ask our city manager to also reach out, see if there's anything we we can do. Yeah. Most certainly. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Sterkwist? Um, what did I write here? You oh, didn't bring your glasses again. They're here, oh, okay. but I, didn't, I took them off. <laughs> the um, Chamber of Commerce event had Mary Sneed. It was well attended and um, learned a lot. I was. I, she did a great job, and I was very appreciative that uh, they share in our willingness to want to keep connecting and building that relationship. So that was really good to hear. Um, our mayor is the next guest. And that what's the date on that, Tom? I believe it's April 17th, Brian. Is that? April 17th. So I think it's April 17th. It's a, is that a Wednesday? Or yes, sir. So. Or, no, Thursday. Thursday. I don't know. I think it's so um, if you be interested in coming to that event, you can sign up with the Chamber of Commerce and come and meet the mayor if you haven't <laughs> met him already. Uh, let's see, I guess we're gonna gear up for some cold weather this coming weekend and um, stay warm. Yes, really. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, you, any final comments? Uh, nothing, uh, just glad to be back here. We're, we're glad to see you back. We yep. hope you're feeling better. Yeah. Good. Uh, you may see me moving my leg from, from below the desk, and that's why I've been shaking. So, so, so you I, don't know, Mayor, you, I mean, Mayor Pro Tem, you and I share the same orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> so uh, we keep track of each other that way. Yeah, my leg is stiff after a while, so. <laughs> did you, Ryan, did you have something you want to say? I have once, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, you, you was done. done. I'm done. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, I neglected to mention one thing. Um, thank you, Deputy Dewey. Um, we are doing a coffee with the captain again on the 16th at 8 a.m. at uh, Starbucks uh, on corner of La Rosemead and Las Tunas. Just come get some coffee. We'll have some pastries for it's, folks. Is the city sponsoring that? Yes, we're we're sponsoring with 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 the sheriff's department. I think the last one was at Cloverleaf. Last one was at Cloverleaf, and this one will be at, at at Starbucks. Eight to ten. Yeah. Eight to ten. Will you reserve parking for us? Uh... <laughs> and there's no parking. <laughs> inside joke there. <laughs> yeah, it's inside joke. Will we park in the yeah, bank yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Well, I think as uh, as former uh, mayor man alluded to. Uh, at our reorganization, uh, you can be very busy as a mayor. And I think we've all learned that as well. And uh, uh, it's, it's been that way for the last two weeks, actually. Um, 
kind of hit the ground running, but I've had the opportunity and, and privilege to attend, of course, several, several events for the city. Uh, one earlier was mentioned, the Homestead Tour uh, at the Homestead Museum, which was, which was a nice event. It, it rained that day, of course. Uh, it seems to always rain on the weekends now, but, uh, but uh, Paul did a great job. Paul Spitzeri put on a great presentation. We had people from the city. We had shuttle buses going back and forth. And so it was a, a fairly good turnout considering the weather. And uh, if you've never been to the Homestead Museum, of course, you'll have to go there. It's got the, all, the, all the facts, all the history of Temple City. Unfortunately, it's in City of Industry, but uh, City of Industry? Yeah, City of Industry, I think so. Um, I did attend my regular CGPIA meeting last week. One of the good things that came out of that is that every year JPIA does what we call retrospective computations adjustments, which is a fancy word for saying that we may get a refund on our premiums that we pay. I'm happy to report that we're not getting a whole lot, but we are one of 20 members that are receiving refunds rather than having to pay more. That's so that's a testament to things that we're doing right in the city uh, as far as risk management goes. And, you know, hats off to staff and, and uh, all that, that help with that. And so they do a great job. So that's, that's one good thing. Um, let's see. Uh, attended a uh, GW supermarket opening. Uh, you missed it. I know. I, was out of I know fun. you were. It was, <laughs> it was a great opening. Um, uh, we had a great time, and I'll tell you what. I was very. I think we were all very impressed with that market. It was huge, and it was beautiful inside. They have pretty much anything you could ever want uh, to buy, and uh, it was just very impressive. And people were very nice and. I look forward to going back there. You'll have to check it out. Chocolate sunflower seeds. Chocolate. I am now hooked, Peggy. <laughs> no, Peggy Those got, are the best. Peggy got the coconut ones for me. Those oh, are good too as well. Oh, I had chocolate. Delicious. So, uh, a great event. Um, that's where the parking uh, thing came from, but we'll forget about it. <laughs> so anyway. Um, chamber roundtable. Okay, as uh, Council Member Sternquist mentioned, very good uh, Round table, and as, as she mentioned, I will be speaking at the next one on April 17th. So um, certainly look forward to having people come, and we're going to kind of give an overview of what's been going on and all the things that we have been doing as a, as a city council. Easter egg hunt. Uh, it was hard to believe, but there were over 800 people that came to that event. Wow. Uh, Jerry was there for all three hours <laughs> taking photos. It was very interesting. If you haven't seen the photos, I think Adam sent it out. The way they set it up, because obviously it was inside, it sort of reminded you of like one of those Disneyland rides where the line goes in and out and in and out. But at each <laughs> station, they had things for the kids to do. Wow. And events and, and the, you know, the, the Easter bunnies were there. And people just had a great time. It seemed like everybody had a good time. Wow. And the line moved pretty quickly. And they were pretty steady for the whole three hours. Wow. I mean, just coming in and out. So, it, you know, hats off to Parks and Rec, of course. They did a great job. And at the last minute, of course, as well. So um, one last event that I was able to attend also on Sunday. Uh, you probably remember Pastor Andrew, who came and gave, his, uh, gave the invocation a few weeks ago. He's the new pastor for the Live Oak Community Church, which used to be Westminster Presbyterian on mm -hmm. Live Oak. Yeah, Westminster Presbyterian. They've taken over, and uh, it wasn't a grand opening because that's like I, <clears throat> you can't call it a grand opening. That's like for a supermarket, not a church, right? But it was great because Pastor Andrew used the perfect words. He says, "It's our public launch." So that's what it was—a public launch. So I thought that was a good phrase, and so they had a public launch of the of the church on Easter Sunday, and they were kind enough to invite me and and attend. And there were a lot of familiar faces there as part of that congregation. And of course, it's, they're trying to grow and uh, we, give, we hope that they will do well. And uh, uh, it's got a great location. As you know, we've used that for the Neighborhood Watch in the past as well. And I think, do we have another meeting before Neighborhood Watch? Because you didn't mention that as well. I think, what's uh, yeah, we Neighborhood did, Watch? Nick, neighborhood Watch is? So, yeah. Is it the 18th? Yes. Yeah, so the 18th. So we will have another meeting before. Yeah. Then. Yeah, 
So, uh, and that's going to be, I believe, at, uh, no, it's not going to be at that, that church. It's going to be at uh, Cloverly. Cloverly, I believe, yeah. <laughs> Cloverly School. Yeah, Cloverly Elementary. So, so we're going to be a busy time. And, uh, you know, I can tell all of you that uh, the sentiment out there in the public is, is good. People uh, really, I think, uh, like what's happening, and we're excited about having a new council member. It's first new council member in a long time. And, and so, our um, past council member left on left a on river his, cruise yeah, today. Yeah, I know. He's, uh, he's enjoying, <laughs> in <Europe>. enjoying uh, <laughs> and retired life. I think life, he's so. in Amsterdam by now. <laughs> yeah, probably. So anyway. Okay, so uh, we will end by having any additional public comments not listed on the agenda anybody jerry go ahead and talk from there your round table is actually friday april 19th oh is that when it is i beg okay thank you for reminding me okay thank you it's a friday it's always i think they always have it on a friday yeah i think it is yeah thank you for correcting april 19th so yeah if i'd have been there on the 17th it wouldn't have been good no <laughs> and um and of course our our prayers and sentiments go out to uh Wallen as a mayor, council member, I'm going to call you mayor, man for a while, right? You know how that goes, right? Our council member, man, mentioned, uh, um, unfortunately, you know, you go to the uh, LA Times website, uh, they have a photo of the, of a damaged building uh, in Wallen. It's actually resting at a 45 degree angle. Looks, looks like, like it's about, yeah, it's like a leaning power, tower of Pisa. It's, uh, it's a very large, probably looks like about six, seven stories high. Uh, 7.4 they're now having a tsunami warning and so I've asked Brian and uh, to reach out as well to them and see what kind of help they may need from us I know it's still early and they're still dealing with the, the crisis but certainly we will reach out and uh, provide any help or care packages perhaps that we can put together and council will be informed of that as well Jimmy's there now Jimmy so. from the T station is, is he there in now? Taiwan. Oh, he's there I now. I believe so, because I went up and I was talking to his wife a couple of days ago, and I asked her about Jimmy, and she said that he was in Taiwan. And was he close his home to? I'm not sure if he was. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's well. Hopefully, he's okay. All right. So, unless there are any other public comments, we will close public comments, and we are now adjourned.